Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this Friday's uh, Zoom session of what's a library if the building is closed. Um, as you know, we've been doing these for a while. And this one, my sharing. This one is number 39, if you can believe that in the series uh, started well, last March. Uh, we're coming right up on the, uh, the one year anniversary of the pandemic. Um, and today we've got two really interesting presenters. Uh, we've borrowed the, the tropes and the stereotypes for Ireland and Missouri. <laughs> I hope our guests don't mind. Uh, and and even the same with the images here, we represented uh, uh, apologies to Ireland for using medieval castle, but it was pretty. And, and in the arch also it's kind of stereotypical emblem for uh, Missouri, certainly for St. Louis. Um, we are the Gibbet Libraries Network. Uh, we're an open collaboration of uh, tech innovating libraries doing different kind of interesting things uh, notably using uh, wireless technology to extend access to library digital services beyond the wall, out walls, out into the community where people actually are. Uh, our partner and host and uh, a recording uh, entity is the International Federation of Libraries and Library Associations and Institutions at the controls is uh, Steven Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA in the Netherlands. And our uh, session sponsor is the Internet Society, the DC chapter. Uh, thank you very much. And also our series sponsor is Adaptrum, is equipment maker uh, in the TV white space space, as it were. Uh, thank you to both of them. So we know more. Uh, our speakers today Join the are, meeting. are uh, Stuart Hamilton who may be on soon, I hope, and is the head of uh, local libraries, development for local libraries for, for the country of Ireland. Uh, Stuart is returning. He's been a speaker before. And we have a first time uh, uh, presenter, uh, Robin Westfall, the state librarian from the state of Missouri. We're anxious to hear what's happening in both of these places. Uh, first, we need to go to the COVID report, uh, which, You'll look familiar, you know, we have good news and bad news. Um, this is two weeks ago. Uh, the, the cases were dropping like a rock, uh, but that seems to have kind of just slowed down in the last week. And then today, uh, it's actually flattening there. We can see the deaths have not fallen off in the last 14 days. And there's a very small decline in total cases. It's generally good news, but it's not all good news. The vaccines are excellent news. I mean, extraordinary uh, accomplishment for medical technology to come up with vaccines in such a short time. And now the logistics of getting them actually out and into bodies. Everybody says into arms. Uh, something about that makes me uncomfortable. Just vaccinating people. I mean, we could say that, can't we? Uh, they're good. Uh, the variants, we don't know really. There's the stories are kind of all over the place. You're protected, you're mostly protected, you're maybe not protected. So far, the evidence is that uh, no one, no one has, who's vaccinated has succumbed to the variants either uh, or has been hospitalized. I think that's uh, the data currently. Um, maybe they're not that bad. We'll find out. We need to continue on with our, with our policies of masking and distancing in the meantime, even if, we're, uh, even if we're vaccinated, which I happen to be happily to report. Uh, this is one of our favorite signs. Is, and we think everybody should have a, a, a sign in their neighborhood that says something like this. You know, you're close to a library, a library outlet, even if it's not an actual library. In the US, tens of millions of people, roughly 80 million people at the last survey, depend on public libraries for internet access. Most have some other source, but they all go there for one reason or another. Some it's their only source, 
many go because it's quiet, maybe it's faster, maybe somebody can help them with it, one reason or another. Uh, but the one thing they do have in common is all of those 80 million people in the US at least have to go to one of those 17,000 facilities. And we think that's an added burden, especially now during the pandemic and that libraries should look at opportunities to extend that service that really even more essential service out into the communities. And there should be some sort of a, uh, an access station uh, in every neighborhood. Even, even one that might have uh, uh, staffing, maybe a, a circuit riding librarian to head out into the neighborhood and meet people on, you know, what, whatever libraries can come up with to make it easier for people to access is really essential service because it provides access to public information and public uh, services, uh, e-gov in a word. And, um, you know, these have been done for people that are connected they didn't intend to create a digital divide among the citizenry to not allow them access, but in effect, that's in effect, that's what they've done by automating a lot of these processes that start out as paper, but many of which are no longer in paper or never were just the way that software happens. So when you confront government at every level, local, state, federal, about that, they go, oh yeah, well, uh, they can go to the library, they'll help you. Well, okay, you can transfer that burden onto the library and they'll take it because they always do. But then that burden includes, okay, how does the library, what does the library require? Well, the library requires people to come to the library to access public information, public services. Why not extend those out closer to where people are? Uh, the other story of the background is uh, climate change. Uh, it's the other main crisis. Uh, we have a social crisis that's been happening in the U.S. Uh, and but the the severe weather events have gotten everybody's attention. The fires in California, incredible storm uh, activity this year. Well, I guess now last year uh, across the Atlantic, uh, an amazing ice storm and very cold temperatures across the middle of the country, disrupting, you know, life. Uh, uh, and the story was it was within five minutes of a, of a catastrophic failure of the grid in Texas, which would have been down for maybe months. Is that even conceivable? What well, civilization would basically come to a halt without electricity for that long? So we are, we're on guard and yet we think we're in recovery pretty much. There's another one, another grim scenario is that the Gulf Stream is at its weakest uh, circulation in the last thousand years. That uh, the water temperatures are heating up and it's slowing down the, uh, the downward uh, movement of the, the cold water uh, uh, across the, uh, the coast of Africa and that disrupts the whole thing. This would have just major impact on weather systems around the world. So let's hope that doesn't get worse soon, but we have to be ready for this stuff. I'm sorry, to, I don't mean to be a doomsayer, but you know, we're in crisis, we're in multiple crises and we just have to be ready. And, and it's gonna be a new role for libraries. It's already a role for libraries as responders. They're just gonna have to be keep thinking about it and what it all means. So back to the good news, or at least the latest news from uh, Stuart and Robin. Uh, Stuart, are you with us? I'm afraid he isn't here yet, so I suggest that Robin All goes right. first. We'll just, I will email. We'll go right to Robin. And Robin, thank you for coming. And uh, let us know what's happening in the Show Me State. You can show okay. up. Well, uh, I'm actually I'm I'm glad to go first, Don, because that means I can just keep talking until uh, you or Stephen <laughs> cut me off. So that's, that's okay. That's you. You're on. You're <laughs> on. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Um, I see a lot of my Missouri colleagues on, and uh, I want to welcome um, everyone else uh, from around the world, uh, potentially. Um, and I want to first start by telling you just a little bit about what the Missouri State Library does and how, if you're not familiar with how li state libraries work, um, what we do is we are the state library um, agency, which to me, that what that means is that um, during the pandemic, what we've been able to do is we've been able to provide guidance, 
um, support, some of that being financial support. Um, and I feel like when you show that picture of Lucy, um, uh, the uh, librarian or the psychiatrist is in, I do feel like part of our role um, and the role that they serve for their communities is a role that we at the State Library here have been serving for our librarians. Um, we, ha we have uh, forums that we started off doing every week and it was, gosh, we're within two weeks, I think, of that being when we started those. It was an immediate reaction um, as libraries started closing that we knew that we needed to keep everyone gathered together as a community. And the best way to do that was to have uh, these public forums and they still continue. We've backed it up to every other week. And honestly, Don, I think my theme of today is going to be, uh, this, it's one of those things that's not going to go away. Um, I, as you had in my quote, um, I still truly believe that it's not about, I don't use the word, I'm gonna have to use it here because it is what it is, new normal. I really think that what our libraries are doing, and I and I, I would bet that Stuart's gonna say that they, saying it's the same thing, is better than what they were, than what they were doing before. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and just show you a, a few of the things that we've been doing or our libraries have been doing here in Missouri. Um, and again, I work for the Secretary of State. Um, our state library is under an elected official um, and the Missouri Secretary of State was recently just reelected and is a very, very strong supporter of libraries. So I'm, we're, we're blessed to have that, that uh, when we need someone to go to bat for us, uh, we certainly have, he certainly has our back. Um, uh, let's see if I can make it go. Where's the next slide? There we go. Um, and when you look at this, what this is, says is that at least 4.4 million, uh, Missouri has um, around 6 million citizens, but 4.4 uh, million of those had access to curbside service. And it wasn't just books that uh, they were getting delivered via, via curbside. Um, this wasn't, as you know, 2020 was a big election year. Um, and part of the uh, requirements for voters in Missouri was that for some of them in certain categories had to have their ballots notarized. Um, and so we had so many libraries who had not provided notary service before, not only got notaries in their libraries, they provided it curbside. You could, they would actually go out to someone's car and notarize their ballot for them. Um, they also did print and fax service curbside. They could, they could send the job to the library and the librarian would bring that out to them in their car. So the majority of Missourians had access to that. Our libraries, 142 out of the 150 some-ish library districts in, in Missouri, uh, the ones that serve 90, 91% of the population, they still offered literacy programs to children from birth to six during the pandemic. They figured out a way to, to do it virtually. And again, as I'm gonna to continue to say, some of the things that they did are things that are not going to go away. Um, we hope 2021's summer reading program is a hybrid. So it still has uh, those virtual components, but there's that will be back to some in-person components. Um, but the fact that, you know, you know, the pandemic starts in March, summer reading program starts the end of May, beginning of June, that they were able to adapt that quickly and still held um, summer reading programs, I think is amazing. The things I'm telling you are not necessarily unique to Missouri. It's, I see it all over the country. Of course, I only have Missouri stats, so that's what I'm, what I'm going to, sh to share with you. Um, online, uh, our public libraries saw 32.8 million online visits um, and almost 5 million users of their library Wi-Fi. Users of their library Wi-Fi when the library was closed. So what that means is that the libraries had extended their Wi-Fi to their parking lots. Um, once libraries started reopening, of course, the Wi-Fi was still used, but um, this was such a critical need to be able to keep up um, and make sure that the Wi-Fi was still going to be open when the actual physical doors of the library um, were locked. Um, there was uh, over 
almost 1300 mobile hotspots were checked out um, to patrons during this time as well. Um, virtual learning, again, we talked about the, the summer reading program. Um, the majority of kids were still able to figure out a way to participate. Um, almost uh, over 3,500 programs um, and uh, over 213,000 kids in attendance for those programs. Um, and then finally, we talked about uh, notary service. The, the uh, over half of Missouri's res residents had access to notary service um, directly from their libraries. Um, I'm gonna stop the share. Um, a couple other things, Don, I wanna mention that, that we're, we're doing here at the State Library um, in response to COVID-19. Uh, we have, at, we got access to federal funds through uh, our normal channels, which is through the Institute of Museum and Library Service through LSTA grants. And then we had the CARES grants, which were specific for COVID uh, relief. Um, so in Missouri, we provided uh, 252 grants to libraries, over $3 million. And these grants were for everything from, like I talked about before, the hotspots, the expanding of the Wi-Fi to PPE, um, to equipment for virtual programming, uh, to e-content. Uh, we really helped libraries uh, beef up their e-content. A lot of it, they, they did that on, on their own. Um, and then the other thing that we knew was critical was that we needed to really increase our continuing education opportunities. A lot of library staff were home um, and they, if they weren't gonna be able to be physically in the building and participating, but still wanted to work, um, these, these continuing education opportunities provided them that option to learn uh, everything from, we do the Homeless Training Institute to self-care to how to manage virtual programs. Um, and we had, you have the state library in that 12 month period, 225 lived or archived training and over 56,000 views of that. Um, again, that's not going to change. It's not that all of a sudden we're gonna, no more COVID so we don't need to do as much CE. That's not the case. It, it certainly is again, one of those things that, that's going to continue. Um, I feel like the thing that's, the impact um, that COVID has had is that it has allowed us to, to try out maybe things that we hadn't tried out before. And there's something to be said about um, the chaos of being forced to try new things and then, and then seeing whether or not they work. You're allowed in a time like this, I feel like if it doesn't work, you can say, well, that didn't work because of COVID or we just couldn't get the people there. It gives libraries that freedom to just really think outside the box and, and try different things. Um, the things I think are going to stay, the program and collections are going to continue to be hybrid. I think that's not, that's not going away. I think a Chromebook hotspot checkout combo, I think those are absolutely going to be things that are going to continue. Curbside, I absolutely love curbside. I love going into a library. I mean, I spent my entire life basically in a library, but I, am just, I love curbside. I have to say, I pop up my trunk, my books are delivered, I get a nice thank you and, and uh, close it and off I go, take my dog with me. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. I, I, I love the, the, the idea of curbside. Um, and I also think that the biggest impact on, on us as a community is how library spaces are maybe going to have to be changed. Do we still need the big library with the huge meeting room? Um, or do we need more express stations? Do we need more of the lockers in communities where someone can just go pick up their holds? Um, and 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 we, Don and I have been talking a lot about kiosk and sort of what the, what that means too. It also means we need these neighborhood uh, Wi-Fi units where what the library provides. Um, so that someone can just sit at a picnic table. It's one of my favorites um, and use the library's Wi-Fi. This may be in the park uh, or by the swimming pool. I, th I think that this is exciting. Um, and that's how I want to look at, you know, what COVID has presented is exciting opportunities um, for our libraries. 
I heard a quote yesterday and the quote was that um, we need to move fast and break things. And how I think about this is, you know, when things break or broken, we can move fast and change things. So when COVID started last March, the how we thought about library service in a lot of ways broke um, the standards of how what we were doing and how our programming, how our summer library program was going to work, it broke. Um, and we had to quickly then move fast. Um, and I think that moving fast, a lot of times, the moving fast, there's a lot of things that can happen when you're moving fast. But overall, I think the moving fast that happened during COVID for libraries has been just a wonderful thing. And it shows our importance we have to keep up with that. We have to keep changing and trying new things and not be afraid to. Um, I, I don't like to use the words. I don't, we don't do new normal here, even though I've had to say it a couple of times. Um, and I don't necessarily like pivot. Um, I'm a big sports fan. And when I think of pivot, I think of that, you guys can't see me, but I think of your pivot foot. When you're playing basketball, you put your pivot foot down and that foot stays down and you have the ball and it allows you to move around and you can look at the defense, you can look at your other players, you can think about where are you going to throw um, the ball. I think that really what the pandemic has allowed for libraries is to use the Hail Mary. Um, I know I'm changing sports. It was basketball and now it's football. But do you use the Hail Mary and you have the absolute best receiver on the end? So I'm a Kansas City fan. So I'm going to say you've got your um, Tyreek Hills or your Travis Kelseys. Uh, and you got Patrick Mahomes throwing it. Our libraries are the Patrick Mahomes uh, uh, of, of the world. And for those of you who don't follow sports, Patrick Mahomes is a good person to be um, if you're going to be a if you're going to be a quarterback. And they throw that ball down there and it's caught, but they don't have time to think about it. They just know that they need to get the ball down there. They need to score. And so the Hail Mary, more than the pivot, um, in my opinion, is what libraries have been able to do um, during this year. We've had to rock and roll. We haven't had time to stop and really analyze things, which is in our heart what we've done all our lives, but we've had to rock and roll. Um, so I'm hoping, I don't know, is Stuart, is Stuart on and is ready to go? I could keep going, Don. But, well, uh, in, we in may respect. have some questions for you, Robin. Okay. Uh, and Stuart is on, and we'll we'll get to him in a second here. But you've opened up a lot of. Uh, uh, well, first of all, you've uh, offered us a basket of metaphors. <laughs> for, <laughs> a basket. For how to think about what you're doing. I I I'm really struck by the uh, the emotional and psychological support that the, that the state library provides. I, you know, it just hadn't occurred to me before, but of course, everybody's under stress or has been under stress uh, in, in this environment. You, uh, uh, you touched on the, uh, well, you mentioned the checkout hotspots. How many of those do you know? Do you have any data on that? How many are out in the state or how long is there a general practice that's being used in the state? I don't know that, I, I, and I should have it. If I could pull up my public library uh, survey data, I would have that exact amount. But um, one of my folks may be online who can provide that. I do know that um, there were 1,200 new ones that were put into service um, in uh, 2020. I imagine the number's a lot higher than that. But Don, what I think is great about that is they were used before COVID they were most, a lot of them were used in the, in the, in uh, the urban areas. Um, and you know, there's such a difference between the, 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 the digital divide and then in, in, in urban areas. And then also it's so completely different in rural areas because while the connectivity may be there in the urban air areas, it's not there in the rural areas, but they both still need the hotspots and they still need obviously technology to help them reach their patrons. Um, so initially, you know, a lot of our urban and suburban areas had those hotspots, but to see teeny tiny little communities picking up on the hotspots and, you know, with everything, this new technology, there are growing pains. Um, when you have multiple carriers, um, we have some areas, and this is again, not unique to Missouri, where you need 
two different brands or two different carriers of hotspots for your library because um, uh, brand X only works on the east side of the county and brand Y only works on the, on the west side of the county. And so it's figuring out exactly how to manage all of that. Um, so I can't tell you the number. I can tell you at least 1,200 okay. were added. But manage and pay for, right? This is and, a new yes. expense. Yes. So um, one of the things always been a question for us about checkouts, you know, who wouldn't want to have such a thing? And who would want to return it if they didn't, if they weren't required to? Well, so, the great thing is the hotspot itself doesn't cost much money. It's the data. And so it's easy for libraries to shut them off if they decide right. not to return it. Right. Is it easy? I agree with you. On three weeks. How does I mean, talk about binging on your favorite TV show when you get that yeah. hotspot for three weeks or whatever. I'm just using that as an example. No, I, it's, it's, a, it's a common use, right? That's what yeah. people want to yeah. do with the internet. Uh, but how, what's the upper limit on this? How do libraries figure out how much of their budget they can allocate to paying for these or the data for these? Well, and you know what, what the real issue is, we provided a in some cases, two years, in some cases, a year of data. It depend on there's a couple of different kinds of grants and, and the specifications were different. It's, it's how they're going to manage that afterwards. And so one of the things you ask, Don, is for us to have a, what, what's, what is that we are asking of, of people at the end of this? Um, libraries have, we are notorious for not um, saying all the wonderful things that we've done. And I tell you what, I, we all need to be standing on our, our rooftops, letting everyone know um, what all we've done. But the funding is going to have to be there. They're going to have to figure out a way to um, fund that without cutting anything else out. I'm hoping that those data plans will, will come down in price and it will be cheaper, but it has to be carved out of the budget for the, for the data plans um, for the libraries. And it certainly is something... When we advocate for libraries, um, when I say up the hill, it's up the hill for me up here in Jefferson City, um, we do talk about the fact that we still need this technology. And this is an ongoing cost that we just need to figure out a way to get more state aid to libraries or more funding to libraries so that they can continue to do this. So this is actually something that can help people right now that have yeah. different kind of many time urgent needs for connectivity. Mm -hmm. and then perhaps act as a bridge while the country is building out further right. to connect people at, right. at home. Um, the, the, the other impact that you uh, talked about is the increase in demand for e-services, e-content. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any rough figures on that increase or We've seen figures all over the place, 25%, 50% uh, increase in demand. And it's reasonable to expect, uh, expect that. Yes, and we're looking at, um, and, and it would be somewhere between that, that, that 25 and, and 50% um, um, increase. And it's going to depend. I mean, there was the, uh, I would say like from April to June or July, that increase was um, exponential. Um, and then it started to level off. It's always, I think, I think the usage is always going to be higher than, than what it was uh, pre-COVID. But as libraries slowly started to open back up, then, you know, some of the print collections, some of the print um, came back. Um, what to me, though, is interesting, Don, is that it's, I, it's going to expand so much beyond just the ebooks. And the audiobooks. I think the I think the streaming video. I think the I think the magazines. And I think things like that. When I look at what my library's database uh, usage um, has increased, they've added databases like one called uh, Creative Bug, which you may have heard, which is fantastic. It helps you. Uh, be creative. It helps you with uh, make things at home. It helps you with projects with your kiddos. Um, I absolutely love that database and I love that libraries offering that and seeing that as, as essential. Um, the other thing is that we are trying as much as we can to help our schools and our libraries are adding things like tutor.com or BrainFuse that has the tutoring component um, that is a supplement to, to what the schools do. And 
I say supplement in some cases, it's the only thing that the schools aren't doing really much of that, of that sort of tutoring. And so the libraries are, are, are it's trying to pick, pick that up. So Don, in addition to the fact that our libraries have had to change the things that, that they're doing, when we look at our future plans, when, I mean, any strategic plan that the state library had before March 15th of 2020 is out the window because we, and I think, again, it's going to be better. Um, we need to look at how we can offer statewide contracts for something like a, a brain fuse. I hate to use a, a vendor, but a, but a tutoring type service or, or a different sort of early learner, learning um, component. We, we really need to look at that, those statewide things again, so that our Kansas cities and St. Louis's obviously have access to that, but our little bitty Mound Cities and uh, Carothersville um, have those have those things uh, as well. Um, so, you know, it's, again, I have to, the thing is, if you don't look at it this way, if you think about all the things that you've lost or all the things that are not going to come back, um, then you're not ever going to, to recover, and honestly. And so your patrons need you to be thinking about, okay, what's next? Let's go break some things. <laughs> what's next? I, I think there are plenty of things that are pre-broken here. I, I, that's the only thing about that, you know, is the idea of breaking them and then, and then moving fast. I think we've gotten plenty of breakage around, but the idea of moving fast I, and the opportunity represents, I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we set this up a year ago as the question, well, okay, what is a library if the building is closed? This this triggers a lot of uh, a lot of thoughts and a lot of interesting activities, and you've illuminated a whole bunch of them around that. I have one more question. We've got a lot of really interesting comments in the, in the chat from people, uh, but uh, curbside. You know, let's just mm -hmm. let's get a little physical here with the uh, not so totally digital and virtual, though that's accelerating across the board, not just libraries, the whole environment is, is much more virtual than it has ever been and it already was accelerating. But how do people, you know, uh, order? I mean, if they don't have a connection, they, they call up on the phone and say, I'd like a book of some type, can you recommend, or I know what I want, or how does that generally yeah. work? And, and, and libraries have had to become really good about, well, we always have. Uh, we do it at the desk when you're trying to decipher what it is, what exactly it is that the patron wants. You know, we all, the, the joke has always been, I really want to read that blue book or that <laughs> green book. And, and the, the librarian knows exactly what they're talking about. The book with the green cover. Yeah, I know, I know that book. Um, but they're having to now do that on the phone and trying to, or uh, if, if they don't have, if they have connectivity, it's a little easier because they're sending you links or they're actually placing the order themselves online. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, that reader services aspect of library service is still just as critical, still knowing uh, if you like um, uh, Grisham, what are some of the other things you're, that, that they would enjoy reading? Those things are still absolutely um, critical. And I want to add one more thing. We here at the state library, most state libraries have the the uh, library for the uh, for the blind and and visually impaired is part of what we do, and what we did in response to COVID because that's an that's an audience that's automatically already isolated, is that we immediately increase the number of cartridges, which is how they they get the, the majority of the materials. Um, at, we increase that number so that they would right from the beginning have enough materials. So if we did end up having to close, and we did close here. And, that, that part of the library codes for a little bit, that they would have stuff. It was just critical that they not be without library resources, no matter what was going to happen here at the State Library. So I just needed to add that too. No, that's good. That's great. Uh, so, okay, uh, we will try to get back around and have a more open Q&A and, and you may have some last thoughts for us and and some uh, admonitions perhaps for uh, the people that have joined us today. So now we'll turn to uh, our longtime colleague, Stuart Hamilton. Stuart, are you with us? I am, Don, and I do apologize uh, for my slight tardiness. In the flesh, so to speak. Uh, welcome back, Stuart. Uh, tell us uh, what's been going on. We put up uh, the, uh, the, the high praise you received from, from President Wiggins 
on the registration side. Be President Higgins, Don. Higgins, not Wiggins. Sorry about that, Mr. President. Uh, we we wondered what you had done to uh, earn that, but then we presumed there was there was something because you're always up to something. So why don't you tell us what it is and and what's happened, you know, in Ireland uh, over the last year through all this? Okay. Well. Uh... If, it, if it's all right, I will run through um, some slides just to keep the conversation on track. Um, because, I mean, Don, you're, you're right. Uh, let's see. I think, I can't remember when you did the first one of these, but I was indeed um, around, right? So right. we've been sort of traveling for a, for a year on this, I guess. Um, so when you asked me to come and speak today, it was an opportunity for me to sort of take a look at what we've done in the whole 12-month period. So... Let's see, if you were speaking to us in February 2020, you would have found uh, a lot of very happy librarians in Ireland. So I'm assuming that a lot of people on the call are not familiar with our system in Ireland, but we have a very, very joined up public library service. We have about 330 branches across the country. We share an LMS. Uh, we share a very joined up system where you can borrow one book from a library anywhere in the country and return it to anywhere else. Um, and we have a national joined up strategy for the whole sector, which is called Our Public Libraries 2022. Um, and at the end of February, we had just come to the end of a national communications campaign for the library sector called Take a Closer Look, um, which had been hugely successful. It was intended to drive up membership. And in year on year, we managed to drive up sort of 17% more members in February 2020 than we had uh, in, in the, the previous February. And we culminated in the National Library Open Day on February the 29th, which we'd never had before. So, you know, in February, we were looking pretty happy uh, and uh, pretty pleased with ourselves. And then, of course, um, you know, uh, around about March 13th, uh, we closed down. So a lot of stuff happened to us, which I think a lot of other people on your, on your sort of webinar have discussed over uh, the last year or so. But in that first couple of weeks, we had to do a lot of work. And I heard what Robin was saying there about how quickly we had to move as a profession. And it was no different in Ireland. A very quick switch to digital, big focus on the digital offerings. Um, our elderly people were called cocooners during that time. Um, you know, really kind of very much housebound. So very quickly setting up delivery services to them. We found a lot of library staff reassigned to what the government labeled the community call. And I'll go back to this in a minute, because at the time we felt it was a bit frustrating to have library staff like pulled across from their own services just to kind of fill in gaps that councils couldn't do themselves. But actually, it's proved very interesting for us. Um, we very quickly had to talk to the Irish publishers to see if they would let us do online story times without having to pay license fees. And we managed to secure that. And then, you know, you've got a lot of staff at home. I don't know if Robin found this as well, but, you know, not every staff member necessarily has a laptop or is able to sign into work. So, you know, we, we very quickly had to, to sort out a lot of the staff during those first couple of weeks to help them actually engage with their own jobs. And then we did some practical things like extending, you know, you could join the library completely online, which previously you had to visit physically for the final piece of it. Uh, and uh, we obviously made sure we have a rolling one year membership uh, so we had to continually extend that so people didn't lose their, their library cards. And we did do a little bit of printing PPE, which I think a lot of libraries did in the initial stages. I also want to mention my other sort of hat, which is as part of the National Authorities on Public Libraries in Europe, or NAPL, which is the same sort of institutions that I belong to. I belong to something called lo the Local Government Management Agency. And my team within the LGMA oversees all of the public library network. Um, and we work with the 30 county librarians um, who run the services in the authority. And we work with them together to help deliver and improve services and implement the strategy. So NAPL is like my equivalence in Europe. And I wanted to point this out sort of at the start here because one of the first things I did was get on to all of my kind of peers and say, what are you doing? What's going on? Um, and, you know, how are things in your country? What can we learn from your country? And very quickly across those 22 countries, we discovered who was doing quarantine, how they were doing it, who wasn't, um, you know, who was doing digital, who had problems with copyright, who didn't. 
Um, and you can find some really interesting stuff. We put together a couple of reports during the entire year, which you can find the European reaction to COVID uh, at the web address that's in it there. And I just mentioned that because, you know, so many things that we were experiencing and that Robin experienced, you know, we're all very much in it together. There's a lot of commonality. This is a bit of a breakdown of how it went after March. Uh, I won't dwell on this for too long, but I'll be happy to share the slides. But the point I'd make is that we had a, an interesting year of, of kind of boomerangs. You know, we were closed, then we were open, then we were closed again. Then we had semi sort of, you can do contact and collect, or you can do kind of curbside as you put it, or now you can't, now you can just do, you know, digital only. And throughout the year, we went all the way through that until really the end of the year when the second wave really hit, uh, we opened up again in Ireland in December and it kind of knocked our knees out from under us, to be honest. We've been closed pretty much since the end of December. Uh, and now what are we at in March? So we haven't had a building open since the end of December. But, you know, there were several tentative steps back in and out of, of opening and reopening. And, and that slide shows some of it there. Uh, Robin said, move fast and break things. I, I, I had used that one. So instead, I've gone to Tom Waits to say, what's he building in there? And this is kind of the, the opportunity we had to um, experiment and to do those kind of things that maybe we wouldn't have had the chance to do before. And Don, you and I have worked for, for quite a few years looking at this issue of, of TV white space and expanding that library Wi-Fi footprint. And I jumped on that. I mean, I really jumped on that. Um, and we, we were able to get a project set up with Microsoft to do a pilot in five different counties to utilize TV white space technology through Airband uh, to extend the library footprint. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that, Don, because I know that's of interest here, maybe in, in Q&A, because there's more detail in that. But we did other cool things as well. Um, we basically have connected all of our public library network through the Wi-Fi to offer access to the Edgerome network which is the network that students can use to sign into Wi-Fi using their own student credentials uh, and access their course materials and all that sort of thing, uh, which you know, some of you may have traveled around the world and have seen these EduRoam networks in various places. It basically enables you to jump onto Wi-Fi without you know, having to go through the process of, of local logins. So we've been expanding that out. We expanded the home delivery services to go beyond the cocooners. Again, I'll come back to that in a second. Contact and collect is something that everybody across the library community was doing. And I might have missed this in Robin's presentation because I'm unfortunately a little bit late. But the fun thing we found was the, the kind of return to classic librarianship almost in the way that people wanted recommendations. You know, they couldn't come in the building, but you know you like thrillers, you know you like romance, you know you like sci-fi. The library staff suddenly were there for their users again to say, hey, look, well, I've got this one. I'm going to pack this bag of books for you and you can come down and pick it up. And those are your choices. People loved that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely loved that. And I built that into uh, a program, which I'll mention in a moment. And I think that's something for us to seriously consider in the future about why we kind of left that behind. And then we've also got another little pilot going on with Facebook, who I don't think have actually worked with that many libraries, to be honest. So this was an interesting um, uh, little kind of uh, connection that we got during the pandemic just by kind of being a bit more visible in the uh, in the space and now we're looking at doing a media literacy for adults uh, training program uh, with with Facebook which is kind of interesting to work with the organization that actually facilitates quite a lot of disinformation so it's a it's an intriguing partnership uh, keep you posted on that Digital, Robin mentioned it. We do have the stats, Don. I mean, um, I mean, we're about to put a press release out from the minister, um, I think, tomorrow here. You know, we are talking year on year, 150% increase in digital loans, 120% increase in e-audiobook loans, 83% increase in new users of our borrow box service, you know, tens of thousands of, of online uh, lessons taken, all of that sort of stuff. The stats are in now at the start of 21. I think that's going to be really interesting for the community as we begin to compare those on mass and see where we've got to. Um, it revealed new users without a doubt in our community. So, you know, the people using our digital services, we don't know yet, but I suspect a significant number of them never set foot in the library before. 
So how are we actually going to deal with that new group of users after this? Very interesting challenge for us. And then the people that were using our services before, we found a lot of them, particularly the older ones, couldn't use the digital services. So we had to, we developed a really nice training program uh, with Age Friendly Island where we used their people to train their people. So we have a peer training program of older people who, who know how to use BorrowBox, know how to use those services, training their peers. And that was so successful, it made the national news uh, towards the end of last year because it was, it was a, real, uh, a real winner. But the thing I'd like to point out here is just the, the, the sustainability of this is just staring us in the face. The prices of these materials are, are, are ridiculous. So we've analyzed our ebook collection. We can see that on average, we're paying you know, two and a half times uh, the cost of a print book for every ebook. And you take that to the big five publishers and you're getting up to four times. In e-audio books, which of course used by you know, the, uh, the visually impaired, it could be as much as seven times the cost of a print book. So, you know, where are we gonna get all the money from this? And one of the big things we did during the year was put a joint statement out from all of the library communities in Ireland, the academic who are having it far worse than the public uh, and the health libraries. And we came together and we asked government to investigate this. And this is something which is a real big piece for us this year, looking at uh, um, competition law and the practices which are gonna cause major problems for us. So that was a, that's a, a big, big thing, which obviously we need to talk about in much more depth. But also this issue of digital poverty has been huge here in Ireland. Um, it was very clear, very quickly, that not everybody has the ability to access these digital services. It became very clear that households very often do not have multiple tablets, so that if you've got more than one kid, you're sharing a tablet at home. Um, and it became very, very clear that people didn't have the digital skills. So there's a huge focus on that now. And we've been able to put the libraries right in the center of that, um, which has been great because of the increased visibility we've had as a result of COVID. And we also adjusted that project, Don, that we have with Microsoft Airband to include device provision, because the Airband project we're doing is a pilot that would reach, say, uh, 20 plus disadvantaged homes within a catchment area. And, they, and we've actually partnered up with further people to provide devices because it's become clear that it's connectivity, it's devices and it's skills. And I know there are very many more varied and nuanced depictions of the digital divide and there should be, but those are the three which are resonating with our politicians. So those are the three that we're gonna hammer. I Stuart, will say- you on that, on that project, on the Airband project? Sorry, say again? Can I ask you about the Airband Please, project? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the homes that are being connected, they're connect. Is, is, is there a, a ISP involved or is it the library providing direct connections or how is that set up? Well, so Don, you and I have talked about this for so long. The reality of putting one of these programs into place has been much more complex <laughs> than perhaps we talked about. Um, we've had to do an awful lot of technical learning. Um, you know, a lot of libraries, bizarre, well, not bizarrely, but a lot of libraries in Ireland are in... Um, heritage buildings or, or protected buildings. So you can't go whacking a, a big mast on the top of those buildings. You know, you need, you need quite a lot of height for these. So we've had to deal with all of that. Uh, we had to get a local ISP contracted to work with them who will install the, the airband equipment along with the, the council broadband officers. And then also to install the receiving equipment in the homes of uh, the, the households that will take part in the pilot. So yeah, uh, and we had to get everything really configured and we had to get these Radwin panels and, and, and things in from Israel that need to be completely configured. It's been fascinating and, and I, I'm glad we're doing it so that maybe we could save other people the learning because we, we only installed the equipment last month and we started the project in March. So uh, yeah, yeah. There's a, I might come back to that. It's, it, there's a lot of learning there. It's really interesting. I'm, 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 very much behind this as a, as a concept and as a project, but it's technical uh, uh, and, and interesting. Are, are these homes connected to the open internet or are they connected to the library? Um, so they're, they're connected to the, the council uh, connection, the library's part of the council connection, and they sign in using their library ID. Okay. So, so basically the library, as it were, picks up the, uh, the usage uh, and you need to, and our, our thing from the very beginning was that what we will do is we will connect these target homes 
with the library. They're going to become members. We're going to offer them services. But the other big thing is, obviously, we, we haven't been able to do many physical things. So we have, you know, we were going to have them down the library for inductions. Here's everything. But they can't, you know, we can't open the buildings. So we're permanently adjusting. We're getting there. But we're, we're you know, it's, it's just the circumstances that we're in. So, but yeah, a real key thing to link up to library membership. Is, okay, is, great. So look, I'll try and be, a, I'm, I'm sure I'm going on, uh, but um, we did do this piece towards the end, of, uh, towards the, the started at the end of last year, which was a thing that the president uh, endorsed. And this was a fantastic opportunity for us. We'd, we'd managed to get so much visibility for the sector as a result of a really strong response to COVID through those programs that I mentioned, particularly around uh, the digital services that uh, we were given funding to undertake uh, a campaign called Ireland Reads, which is a, a national day of reading that happened on the 25th of February. Uh, we developed a website and the whole concept was based around Earth Day. So other countries have done this. It's not a completely original concept, uh, but it's based very much around that drop everything and read piece. Uh, but what we treated it as was we were looking at people who kind of got out of the habit of reading uh, a bit like, I don't know if you guys know the Couch to 5K app, you know, you've been watching television for years, you haven't got up, and now you want to run 5K. This is going to teach you to do it in such a way that it'll be, you know, incremental. So we developed a website where people could pledge minutes on the 25th. And then we took those learnings from that contact and collect piece that I mentioned, and we built a book recommendation engine with input from all of the library staff across the country. So that if you've got uh, a favorite genre that you like, you know you can spare 10 minutes a day to read, and you think you're a reader at this level of difficulty, we'll spin the wheel, give you a book, and tell you how many days it'll take to read it. And this has been hugely successful. Um, and it's something that I'm now really keen to try to turn into an app or something. And I don't want an algorithm. I don't want Amazon, you've bought this, now try this. I want the, the accumulated knowledge of our staff to be giving these recommendations. And, you know, I asked for recommendations from the, from the, from the staff, we've got about 1600 across the country. And within a day and a half, I had nearly a thousand. So it's, it's, it's phenomenal really. And, and we, we, I won't dwell on this too long. It was just a massive success. Go to the website. We've, we've taken down a few bits now, including the pledge, but the book recommendation engine is still there. And it, it's very basic, but it works. Um, and we got a ton of ambassadors. We got the the T-shirt, the effectively the prime minister. He did his message, the president, sports stars, et cetera, et cetera. So really positive. Way to go. We're closed right now. And this is frustrating. Um, so across Europe, mostly, Stephen may, may, may also comment on this, but mostly we're seeing public library services very restricted in what we can actually offer. Um, and in Ireland, we're, there's no exception. We're just waiting to see whether we're actually going to be able to open up any, in any way in April or May. Nothing this month. It's all about digital, all about digital. And then, of course, that brings those issues of money and funding back into play. So, look, I'm going to try and wrap up. But look, this is what I've kind of observed. And I, I, I don't know if it chimes with, with Robin, but basically it's been a massive opportunity for us to get visibility for the service. And that's worked very well for us. Um, it's not a, a huge country. We're lucky enough that people love their libraries. Uh, we have good favorable sort of media positions uh, and we've been able to get the visibility of the service, particularly you know, things like printing PPE at the beginning, serving, cocooning people, making sure that the, the people from that community call were well served um, has been really good for us. And that's generated in turn staff confidence the staff have really grown during this period. Um, and what started out at the beginning, where you know, we, try, we, we tried to reproduce what we did in the library physically, digitally, or oh, here's our story time, and we're going to read it, and it's going to go digitally. We've discovered over the last few months that actually our events are now being born digital. So hybrid is already here. You know, We talk about hybrid. It's already here for our staff. So everything is now being developed in a hybrid way in a very natural sort of process. Uh, and I mentioned the recommendations, and that's been absolutely huge. Um, the community call has revealed new pockets of library users in each authority that maybe we weren't as much in connection with before, who weren't near a library, but now we're delivering to. 
And we've been mapping those using Google Maps to tell us more about the user groups that we could be reaching out to. And because people are calling librarians on the community call, they're getting to understand the needs of their users as well. So we'll also be doing a design thinking pilot for a number of authorities in 2021 that will seek to try and build on that to design services for those people. But there is concern about whether people are going to actually come back in the buildings. Um, and this is, this is definitely under the surface, a little bit of nervousness uh, for staff and I think for, for, for shops uh, and for people you know, who have that public face. How far have we gone into the digital realm? Are we going to get everybody back? So that's, that's something we're going to have to take a look at. And then this big focus on health and well-being that was there from the Island Reads campaign that I mentioned, that's cross government. That seems to be across society. There's a big role we can play in that space. I mean, in Ireland, we already have a national program called uh, Healthy Island at Your Library. But that and our program on employment, I think, are going to be huge in 21 as we try to rebuild the economy. And then lastly, there's a new adult literacy, numeracy and digital literacy strategy, a national strategy that we're right in the middle of. And I'm pushing for a new national program on digital literacy to be run through libraries. So fingers crossed we'll get that. Uh, but all of that is building on the fact that everybody in the community has stepped up massively throughout the COVID thing. So look, there's a couple of other observations there. Budgets are obviously gonna be an issue. I heard Robin mention that I think at the end, we know it's coming. Uh, so that's gonna be a challenge. We have to do a new national strategy. Our current one finishes at the end of 2022. So that's gonna look a lot different. There's things like remote working. We've got new library builds, all these things to consider. But look, I'll stop there. I'll stop sharing. I know I've gone on a fair bit, Don. I hope it's not too long. Um, no, and I'm happy not, to that's fair. No, that's great, Stuart. I mean, uh, there, you touched on so many things. We could take at least another couple of hours going through each one of them uh, to, to drill down uh, more deeply. You do remind me though, that I think you did use the uh, expression, uh, uh, break things and move quickly about a year ago. I think that was- I've been dying to be Mark Zuckerberg for many years and, and to have his money too. Well, well you, one thing you learn about being in the Midwest is that everyone does and says everything before it comes to the Midwest. So Stuart, uh, it's okay that it took a year for that same <laughs> to, to mid-Missouri, so. <laughs> Stuart, you used your mom uh, as an example a year ago. Uh, I, I guess she was one of the cocooners. How is she doing? So yeah, that's, that's my, my mother-in-law is in the West. She's in Mayo, uh, which is uh, where my wife uh, grew up and is from. And we actually spent some of the lockdown periods in, in Mayo over the last year. So she was, uh, she's doing very well. And she was also um, an absolute beneficiary of that recommendation service. She's a big local library user. Um, so she, you know, we actually had her lined up to speak to the Irish Times as part of the Island Reads uh, campaign, but unfortunately we never got that one over the line. Um, but yeah, she, she, she would have sung a good song for libraries. Yeah, she's, really, she's a big fan. Well, uh, uh, that's great. I, you know, your, your quote, the one we used in the uh, registration site, about reading, you know, about reading for pleasure and the value, you know, the practical value of that uh, is something we tend to lose as we virtualize every uh, corner of society. And, and so re kind of returning to that as, a, as an anchor concept for libraries, I think is really valuable. Uh, and, and you also mentioned so many things I, I wanted to ask about. One of them was you know, as you're, as you're speaking with people, you're learning a lot about what's going on with people, which seems like to be very valuable to feed into the other agencies who want to know these kinds of things. Is that, is that fair? Are you becoming kind of a, the face of government? Well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so we, we got out of the gate very quickly in Ireland with the, the, the physical uh, we, we did a piece called the physical Re recommendations on handling physical materials and we had that up and ready within three weeks or so of um, of the, the the closure so all about quarantine right so at the time I know there's been so much work done in the US uh, on the surfaces issue but you know we we basically we surveyed all the Naples members we contacted PLA 
And we put this, we put this out, and basically we discovered that we, the libraries, were were weeks, maybe even months ahead of the rest of local government who loved it. They jumped on it. And all of a sudden we found we were doing things that we were ahead of everybody else, whether it was digital activities, social media. In in the first week of May, I did a Teams live event for all of the library staff in the country. Um, and, you know, we'd never have actually thought of doing that pre-COVID or we would have thought about it, but it would have been something we would have liked to have got to, you know. Right, right. Um, and there we were doing it in the first week of May. We had 500, 600 people on um, and I was able to tell them exactly what was going on. Uh, and, you know, everybody was sharing their own experiences. And then you realise that the rest of the local government sector weren't doing anything like that until, uh, you know, at least a month, six weeks later, and were asking us for help. So we established pretty quickly a, a kind of reputation as being on top of the tech, which was great. Um, and I think I'm trying to surf that as far as I possibly can until they start saying, we're going to cut your budgets now. And then I'll be like, uh, yeah. But I think the, the thing I mentioned about the community call, I only, only this week I did a, a bit of a round table for all of our county librarians. So I guess they're kind of similar to the state librarians, but obviously at scale. Um, and we asked them to do breakout groups about what had worked and what hadn't worked in COVID so far. And the feedback I got on that community call piece where people were discovering much more about the needs of their community as a result of having to be there uh, when they were calling up, asking where they can get their food from and all of that sort of stuff was, was a byproduct which seems so obvious when you think, when you actually start talking about it, but we hadn't stopped to consider that we've now got this massive amount of new information about our users and in turn we've given them new information about what the library does so it's it's a really nice sort of thing and um yeah i can see a, a few new services coming off the back of that yeah. sure we had libraries that were um especially during the summer that were providing meals and with the meals that they were delivering they were providing summer reading program information and we have libraries that, and these are things aren't, that aren't going to stop, as, as I've said before, that um, they have, they, they had started providing diapers and uh, feminine hy hygiene products right at the beginning of the pandemic. Well, both of those became so much uh, the, the critical need um, that they, even when the building closed, they were offering those sorts of things, even the food via drive up and curbside, mm -hmm. um, which, you would not but before this would have thought about libraries providing meals, uh, partnering with uh, with uh, community um, food banks and providing meals curbside or walk up, um, so to speak like that. And of course, you know, the other the the the, the diapers and the uh, and the uh, hygiene products as well. I mean, that's just a completely different thinking than than what was done before. And mm. now what I'm hoping is that those are things that become almost standard if it's possible and not just our urban areas, but in, a, but in the rural and uh, smaller areas as well. Um, and so I, I, one thing that I wish, and I think I can say this, I'm looking at all the attendance, I think I can make a sort of political statement without getting myself in too much trouble is that we, our library directors have had to rely on their relationship with the county health departments to determine when they were going to reopen, what was the safe protocol. Um, we didn't really have a statewide mandate um, of any sort. And so that put all of our libraries in such a, that, that made it even more difficult because there wasn't someone saying that you have to close from this, time to this time and then when you reopen this is what you have to do so we quickly had to come up with some guidance for that um, but without that statewide mandate it was just it was just so difficult for them to all those decisions are hard to make on your own but it, and so it certainly would have been easier if there would have been more more guidance um, at that level the good thing, this is how I always got to think about that, is that now these library directors have relationships with their county health department. Well, maybe they wouldn't have had those relationships before. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's great. And, and uh, you both remind me of our favorite metaphor uh, for libraries as the Swiss army knife of public institutions. And just more things are dreamed up and 
put on the library or people just come to the library because they don't know where else to turn. It just, it just doesn't stop. And I think that's the upshot of this crisis is that a ton of new things are defaulting to the library because nobody knows what to do and the librarians tend to be able to figure things out. So uh, thanks, Robin. We'll take that as your closing uh, remarks. And uh, Stuart, we'll go back to you uh, and to wish you good luck with the publisher's intervention. We hope that goes well. That's just a, a, an atrocity of, of uh, abuse of, of intellectual property uh, that's bestowed, I think, by government in the first place uh, through law. Uh, and uh, uh, what, what would you... Well, make just any closing statement you'd like to. What recommendations would you make to everybody listening, watching? Um, I think that we as a profession, I'm going to stick with the ebooks thing because it's the thing that, that really drives me mental. Um, I think we as a profession should be outraged and we should show uh, outrage over this issue. And I think we're going to be doing some more stuff in Ireland with the ebooks SOS hashtag which is being used uh, particularly by colleagues in the UK at the moment to draw attention to the ridiculous pricing issues, particularly in the academic libraries. I would like to see us as a profession fully aware of all of the issues. I mean, there's a lot of us as a global profession. So just because we know about it doesn't mean everybody does. So I think we need to bring everybody up to speed on what's going on. Because frankly, I mean, we had an additional 400,000 euros ploughed into the service, very gratefully received from central government during 2020 to meet the demand. We did projections for 2021 and asked the local authorities to cover the cost of our eBooks for 2021. And because we've remained closed in January, we had to go back to them just six weeks into the year and ask for another half a million. So we have to ask ourselves, is this sustainable? What do we want it to be like? Um, and so on and so forth. And I won't go on about it too much, but there's a great webinar that's coming up, which I think is open to everybody, which is being hosted over in the UK. Don, I can share the, the, the email with you. There'll be some public library stuff. Europe's going to be a bit of a hotbed, I hope, on this. Um, and I just think that we should be really raising the temperature. And I think the way we do that is by, coming, by being completely educated across the profession about what's going on and then being public about it. Very good. Excellent. Um, we're over just a few minutes or an hour, but that's okay. Uh, this is this is not a TV show, uh, uh, but uh, we will uh, bring this to a close. We're going to hang out here for a, a few minutes more, uh, as we normally do for anybody that has the time and wants to. Um, uh, Stuart, you uh, you you both uh, put up uh, fascinating slides. If you have links to those. We can't really distribute the files, but if you can, if you have links for those somewhere I, uh, that you could forward to us, we will put it in the uh, in the uh, list, the recorded uh, uh, session uh, on Gig can Library. I, yes, can I add it? Can I add it in the chat here, Don? Because that might be actually uh, easier okay. for me. Right. That'd I be fine try. too. So, Robin, I'm going to give you yet one more last word. Okay, so uh, and I'm going to put a link to, um, so I'll do my last word and then hopefully before you end it, I'll get a link um, as well. And it's going to include information on this from this slide and some other information that we have available um, as well. Um, and, and I guess the, there's one other plug I want to, I, I want to uh, say something that's going on right now in the U.S. Congress is there is an, there's uh, the build uh, Build American Libraries Act. Okay, I know it's got those three words. I may have the order um, incorrect now that I've said it. And what this is, is this is, this is $10 billion uh, for uh, construction projects for libraries. There's never been nationally, and for many of us statewide, uh, some states do it, any sort of funds for building projects. They're just as, it, it just has not been something that has been legislated. Um, before. Um, and so I, and I'll put a link that has information about that. Um, wherever you are here in the United States, it's important to contact your, your congressperson um, and let them know how important this is. A lot of libraries, um, and Stuart talked about this, is, is are, if, are they going to come back? What is that going to look like, the physical building 
um, when they when they do come back. A lot of you are going to want to make changes to your HVA system, are going to want to build library expresses or or kiosk or something um, somewhere. You are going to have to make modifications to your building. And, and that's in addition to the fact that we have so many aging library build, buildings right now. And with the funds not being there, that this is just this is just a critical piece of legislation that's making its way um, through Congress right now. So, oh, thank you. Uh, Tanya put that in the in the chat for us. So thank you, Tanya. It's a, a great uh, point. So please, please, please take a look at that. Um, and uh, my last call would be any way that you can advocate for that. Get your local, your state's library association involved and make sure your state library is involved and, and helping get the word out of how important this legislation is. Great point. You know, all you need to do is give people a moment to think about what libraries represent to the community, to themselves, to their families, and they tend to be supportive. Um, I'm going to ask everybody now to unmute, if you would, unmute. Everyone, please unmute because we want to recognize our speakers, Stuart and Robin, and thank them for their delightful and insightful presentations. Thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. Aloha. Oh, yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay, we'll close the recording now. Thank you very much. Come back. Well, no, actually, we're going to take spring break next week, but come back soon. We'll be in touch. And the, and the sharing of that 